Hi, I'm Tom Woods, and you're listening to the Libertarian Christian Podcast. Welcome to the show that gets Christians thinking about faith and politics. Get ready to challenge the status quo, expand your imagination, and tackle controversy head on. Let's stand together at the intersection of faith and freedom. It's time for the Libertarian Christian Podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Libertarian Christian Podcast, a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute. I am your host, Doug Stewart, and this is an episode that I have been looking forward to doing because I rarely get to invite people into conversations that I love having with my friends. And I often don't have deep conversations with friends that are able to be recorded. But I have a friend who's probably my longest running friend uh, since I began, uh, since adulthood. And he and I have had a conversation about politics and government, and we disagree on a number of things. We agree on a number of things, but we're always constantly kind of circling around certain topics around American politics. And I have him on here today. And uh, his name is Colby. Colby, thanks for being with me. My pleasure. It's really great to have you being willing to be recorded on a more formal conversation. And I also have another friend of mine, uh, Mike Meharry, whom many listeners know from a few episodes that you've been on. And we've been on, uh, I've been on your podcast and some people from LCI have been on your podcast. So you're a friendly voice. So you can say hi. Hello. Mm -hmm. Thanks for coming <laughs> on, Mike. And people might be wondering, you know, Colby and Mike have never met. And uh, of course, I'm bringing them together in a conversation because Colby asks really good questions that I also ask when I'm in the mode of doubting the efficacy of certain, you know, American political institutions. And Colby articulates it really well, as you'll as you'll soon hear. And I've often, when I'm talking with Colby, we'll be talking about like the way American politics is done or the this thing about the Constitution or the sort of like the founder's intention or whatever it might be. And I'm like, oh, man, I wish Mike were here because I actually don't know that answer. And it's not a matter of like, oh, I wish Mike were here to defend my side of the answer. It's like I don't actually know the details in order to make an educated decision or or comment or remark about it. So anyway, I, I want this to be a conversation. And I'm so I'm letting you listeners in on a conversation that I've wanted to have for well, let's see. The first time I really thought of it was like soon after the lockdowns happened in early 2020-ish and Colby and I were using our recreational outdoor time to yell at each other from six feet away. I'm kidding. <laughs> so anyway, thanks guys for, for both coming on here and doing this. The central theme of this conversation is about the idea of federalism. And in order to kind of kick off the conversation a little bit, I'm going to have Mike sort of describe what is federalism? How did the founding fathers, you know, sort of envision the federalist system that sort of yielded us at least the, the start of the Constitution that we have? Okay, so first off, let me kind of, people might know me more in this context from my Godarchy podcast. And uh, so I'm going to take my Godarchy podcast hat off and I'm putting my Tenth Amendment Center hat on. I'm the National Communications Director for the Tenth Amendment Center. I've spent way more time studying the Constitution than I probably care to admit. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'll lose my good Christian anarchist creds, uh, but <laughs> I think this is a this is this is going to be fun. I think it's a, a great issue, and and so just wanted to kind of put that out there to start yeah, with. Yeah. So I think most people, due to the educational system, due to the way politics has evolved really since the war between the states or the Civil War, as you, the Yankees like to call it. Most people have this notion of the United States as being one single nation. And we say it every day when we're kids at, at school in the Pledge of Allegiance. You know, it's one nation under God indivisible. And really, any of the founding generation would have looked at you sideways if you had given them this notion that, that the United States is one nation because it was never intended to be that. It is actually a confederation of states. We don't have a national system. We have a federal system. So what do we mean by federal? Well, today, when you hear the word federal, most people think of the federal government. So they think, oh, it's Washington, D.C. That's not really what federal means. Uh, the easiest way, I'm just going to actually read the definition uh, from Black's Law Dictionary, which describes the difference between a nation and a federal republic. A national government is a government of the people 
of a single state or nation united as a community by what is termed as the social compact and possessing complete and perfect supremacy over persons and things so far as they can be made the lawful objects of civil government. So France, for instance, is a nation. It's one government. There's no states. The cities, and I don't even know if France has counties, but let's assume they have counties in France. They are all completely subject to the national government. Going on with blacks, a federal government is distinguished from a national government by its being the government of a community of independent and sovereign states united by compact. So really the United States, it's not like France. It's really more like the EU in that each of the states retains its sovereignty only giving up the powers that were delegated specifically in the Constitution. So under the American system, most governance was intended to be at the state and local level, not at the national or uh, we, we would say federal level. See, this is where people, people get confused because you say the federal level and this federalism. But if I say the federal level, I'm talking about the national government, Washington, D.C. And uh, I, I think the easiest way, to, I think the best, most succinct description of the American system is found in Federalist 45. It was written by James Madison. He said, the powers delegated to the federal government, meaning the national government, by the Constitution are few and defined. Those which remain with the states and the people are numerous and indefinite. And he went on and he described the things that would primarily be the objects of this national government. They involve war, peace, foreign trade, foreign relations, big picture kinds of things like that. He said, all of the things that pertain to the life, liberties, and properties of the people or the internal improvements and governance of the states would remain with the states. That was what was generally understood to be the system that was created by the Constitution. Now, obviously, we don't have that today. We now, in effect, have a national government. We flipped that on its head. And uh, so now we basically have a situation where the national government has numerous and indefinite powers, and the uh, states are basically relegated to be political subdivisions like a county in a state. So that's kind of the, the difference between a national and a federal government. We were supposed to have a federal government. We now have a national government. I think that's to our detriment. And um, so, yeah. Well, You know, as this conversation goes a little bit, it might be part of the reason why there's a lot of frustration and like, well, why can't it be this way that Colby and I talk about? Because it sort of is a federal constitution trying to operate or a national government trying to operate with a federal constitution. And there's a lot of like conflict and frustration and stuff because, you know, during the early stages of the pandemic, there was a lot of questions over who had the power to do what. And, you know, all of a sudden everybody knows who their governor is now, which is, you know, it's kind of a small silver lining, I suppose, um, (laughs) depending on who your governor is. Right. Um, And yet Trump was still interfering with certain things. And, you know, people like you and me, Mike, were like, well, what's the president doing? You know, why is the president involved at all in some of these things? And, you know, I think it was the the last president was like over 100 years ago when there was like a national emergency. Uh, it was like a hurricane or something. And he's kind of like, hey, that's the state's budgets. Right. You know, that's not the federal government's job. So, I mean, we're, we're a long ways away from that. But there is a lot of frustration that, you know, both Colby and I were lamenting on our, you know, when we when we did get together in the early parts of the pandemic. It's like, man, it is really inefficient. And there's some things, you know, that are going there. One of the reasons that I think that, that Colby offers a unique perspective is that Colby spent, I think, 10 or 11 years overseas. And I want to let him give a little bit of an intro into like some of the things that helped shape his world and thought process. He got to see something completely different in action, even though, of course, he grew up in the United States. So Colby, I'll let you kind of introduce yourself a little bit in that in that vein. Sure. Yeah. I guess one of the uh, things that has made me think more about this issue is that uh, my wife and I spent uh, just over 10 years living in Japan, which is uh, a unitary state. So the opposite of federalism. And um, it does function just as as Mike described. Basically, they have states in, in Japan, prefectures, they call them, but those prefectures are just subdivisions of the national government. They do make some decisions on the on the state and, and local levels, but 
basically the only decisions they're making are what authority is delegated to them from the national government. During our, our time in Japan, we both got to experience that system and also spent a lot of time as we'd interact with our Japanese friends, um, you know, kind of explaining all the weird stuff about the American system or, or what was weird to them at least trying to explain, well, why does, why does America do it this way or that way? I, I, people would always ask me, you know, well, what's the law in America in regard to such and such? And I'd have to explain, well, actually in America, we have 50 different states with 50 different laws on that particular topic. So there is no one way. And so I don't know that that necessarily made me for or against a federal system, but it, it did make me think a lot more about it. And, and did it make sense? Yeah. And so I guess the other thing too, is that I, I've probably, I'm the kind of person who who likes things to be very well ordered and very well coordinated. So that's one of the things, one of the two kind of impetus for this conversation that we're having now that kind of kicked this off. As Doug said, we, we were talking about the seemingly chaotic system in the US in response to the virus and then, you know, comparing that to some of these Asian countries who've had very hyper-focused, nationally driven systems. And I realize that they're, you know, very different cultures, uh, very different populations even. But uh, kind of comparing the two of those and saying, you know, gee, what does that mean for how valuable is a federal system? I, I see exactly where you're coming from. And, and I think part of it is, you know, it's it's how are we programmed and program maybe is a harsh word, you know, but I mean, in a sense we are, how are we taught to think? And in, in the United States, again, especially over the last, certainly 100 years, certainly the last 50 years, most Americans think of themselves as Americans. We think of ourselves as one big nation. We don't think of ourselves as, you know, Kentuckians or Virginians or Floridians, which is interesting because if you, if you go back to the founding era, uh, if you ask somebody where they were from, they would say Virginia before they would say the United States or before they would say they're American. They would say they're Virginians because that was their, that was their political identity. The political society, the foundational political society in the American system is the state. So it's easy to try to compare the United States with Japan or the United States with you know, France or, or whatever other country we want to compare it with, when really we should be comparing Virginia with Japan <laughs> or, you know, Kentucky with Japan. So to me, I, I, it, it's, a, it's a change in the way that, that we think of things, the way we think of the scale. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you can say, well, they're, they're much more efficient in Japan because it's a unified state. Well, okay, that's probably could be argued in Virginia or, you know, whatever state you want to pick out of the, out of the air. Yeah. I'm not a big fan of unified centralized decision-making and authority. And I think that when you look at any system, the the issue that to me comes up, and this is kind of going you know beyond the Constitution or whatever, just looking kind of big picture. When you have a centralized system, you're basically saying that you're going to have one, one size fits all policy for you know whatever it is. So you have Japan, it's basically the size of California. Uh, I just looked it up. There's 126 million people in in Japan. Right. So it's about a third of the population of the United States, a very homogeneous uh, society. In the United States, you have 325 to 350 million people, a very diverse society, uh, even from state to state, uh, certainly even within states, you have, have a lot of diversity. I don't think it's a healthy system to say that, uh, you know, one president in however many people we have in Congress are going to set policy for that many people over that big of an expanse of a country. And do it well. And do that, it that well. That meets the needs and, and representation of everybody. Yeah. yeah. And Mike, let me, uh, let me just jump in here and say, in our, in our debates, uh, one of the things that I've been very clear on with, with Doug is that I'm not necessarily advocating for a, uh, a nationalized system in the United States. I don't know that that would be very workable. I guess the the thing that I've been debating in my own mind with federalism it, it kind of goes back to the um the famous Henry Clay quote about a good compromise is something that makes both parties unhappy and that is to say that it seems like the federal system to me both in, in the current version that we have and I agree I think you made a good point that it's it's very different what we've got today from maybe what the founders envisioned but the federal system that we have today basically kind of puts a lot of 
control into the hands of the states that kind of makes it a patchworky sort of thing, but at the same time takes a lot of control out of the hands of the states so that they don't really have sovereignty either. And and it feels like we've kind of got the worst of both worlds. That's that's kind of what I've been pondering about, you know, is the federal system effective? Yeah, I think that, I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head. I mean, really, in effect, we have a national system. The states have very little real power. They have more power than they realize, and, and they can certainly assert their power and authority when they want to. I think the best example of that is the fact that the federal government insists that we have marijuana prohibition and yet I can go into 36 states now and get marijuana legally in some way, shape, or form. So when, when the states don't want to cooperate with the federal government, they, they don't have to, and they can set their own policies. But by and large, we are run with, with federal policy. I mean, I mean, think about this. The federal government dictates how much water is in our toilets, and it dictates what kind of light bulbs we can have in our light fixtures. So the federal government has this huge impact and imprint. So, I mean, I guess you could argue in, in one sense, I mean, why why go with the pretense? Why don't we just erase the states and quit pretending? You know, I, again, I think that would be to our detriment because I don't think it's healthy for, for a political system of this size of a country. I, I think the country is too big to be properly represented by a by centralized government. But I mean that's effectively what we have. And I think I think you're absolutely right, Cody. I think the that we're we're basically have a national system masquerading as a as a federal system and it doesn't work it doesn't work at all. Yeah, I mean in my mind I, I think I would say that the national system may not be ideal or excuse me, the federal system, I guess is what I'm trying to say, may not, is not really ideal. And that either a national system or a a system more like the European Union, where the individual states actually do have true sovereignty would be preferable over what we've got now, one one or the other. But it's this weird middle that we're kind of stuck in. Yeah. Well, and, and, and so that's where, you know, the Tenth Amendment Center, the work that we do, our foundational premise is that decentralization is superior to centralization. So, our goal is to try to push the system back a little bit closer toward that that more federal decentralized system where California can do its thing and Pennsylvania can do its thing and we can quit you know having this brutal fight over who controls the national system because i think that's part of why politics has gotten so ugly you have so much power at the disposal of really the president. I mean, we can we can look at how that's broken down. I mean, we basically have an elected king at this point, and there's not even the proper balance between the legislative and, and the executive branch. You not only have concentrated power in Washington, D.C., you've concentrated power into the hands of, of a single president. Nowhere is that more clear than when it comes to war. You know, the president now effectively has unilateral decision-making on whether or not the United States is going to have a have a war or not, and that's absolutely a horrible system to give one person that much power. Mm. So, you know, at the Tenth Amendment Center, my goal I'm I'm a decentralizationist. I'm going to decentralize any opportunity that I get. Of course, I'm fighting an uphill battle because, again, the <laughs> the majority of people love the idea of centralized power because in their minds they think that if they can just get the right people in charge. They can mold the whole country into the whatever political vision they might have. And libertarians are just as guilty as this as anybody. I know a lot of libertarians that think we're going to get control of the federal government. We're going to impose liberty, by golly. Well, that's dumb. It's not going to work, you know. Uh, let me ask you one question that that Doug and I have been kind of debating, and I'd like to hear your opinion on it, uh, especially being a Southerner. One of the things that we've kind of batted back and forth is – The states really don't have – one of the marks to me of the fact that the states don't really have true sovereignty is that they don't have the right to – separate from the the union. I mean, well, you know, what I was saying to Doug is let's say that uh California says, you know, we don't really like the way that the the rest of the country is doing, you know, x or y and we think it's hurting us. Well, they have very limited amount of of recourse for that and, and they don't even have the right to say we're just going to go be our own country. We don't want to be a part of the US anymore. Where do things stand in the US? on that. I mean, did the war between the states, as as you referred to it, settle once and for all that states can't leave the union, that they really aren't sovereign and making their own decisions about what government they're under? 
That's a great question. I, I think it's clear if you go back to the way the union was created, it was, let me back up even further than that. We had the revolution and the states declared independence essentially as 13 individual countries. And at the end of the Revolutionary War, if you read the Treaty of Paris, which was the uh, the agreement that ended the war between the states and the British government, the British government actually recognizes 13 individual states. So there was no sense of, of it, you know, being a single country. It actually lists all of the states as being independent states. So then you had the, uh, the Articles of Confederation, which actually came together uh, during the war. And in that sense, if you read the Articles of Confederation, it's very clear that they were independent sovereign states. You fast forward to the Constitution, it's very clear that each individual state as an independent political society made the decision on whether or not they were going to join the union. And, you know, there's this debate in uh, in kind of constitutional law about whether or not the United States was one people or whether it was uh, created by people of the states, each individual states. I think the answer to that question is clear. The fact that by the time North Carolina and Rhode Island refused to ratify, they were the last two states to ratify, the vast majority of the population of the United States had ratified the Constitution. Rhode Island and North Carolina did not join the Union. They did not send representatives to Congress. They were not considered part of the United States until they actually voted to ratify the Constitution. If we actually had this one American people thing, then as soon as we had a majority population within the states, then North Carolina and Rhode Island would have been part of the, part of the deal. So if each individual state as an independent political society made the decision to enter a union, it logically follows that they can make the decision to leave it. And that's exactly what South Carolina did. You know, I, I don't even think a lot of people realize how Southern secession actually happened. And, and we can't, we have a very difficult time separating the act of secession and the reason for secession. I mean, absolutely, I reject slavery. Um, that doesn't change the fact that what the Southern states did when they actually voted for delegates, called a convention, and then debated in that convention whether or not they wanted to leave the union. Uh, that was the exact same way that the Constitution was ratified through delegates that were elected to a convention to ratify the Constitution. So I think clearly in the constitutional system, states have absolutely every legal right to secede uh, and, and leave the union. And in fact, it's interesting, if you go back to the early days, a lot of the northern states talked secession uh, mm -hmm. long before southern states ever talked about it. There was a big secession movement in the north in the 1800s during the War of 1812. There was a sense that, hey, we're just too different. Southern culture, northern culture, industrial, agriculture, all those differences, slavery, non-slavery. There was a lot of people up north that and they actually held a convention in Connecticut and talked about uh, New England secession. So this wasn't really a, a, a controversial idea until Abraham Lincoln decided that, by golly, we're not going to let you leave the Union. And so then that brings this whole issue of did the Civil War settle the issue? Well, I guess it did settle the fact that if you have enough firepower, you can make people do whatever you want them to do. Uh, when people tell me that the Civil War settled the issue of secession, it kind of kind of grates on me a little bit because basically you're saying that whoever can punch somebody the hardest is going to win the argument. And, and, and I guess in the real world, that's the truth, right? I mean, yeah. you know, if somebody, if somebody wants to send in, if California held a, a you know, a secession uh, convention and decided to leave the union and uh, president, I guess it's president Biden. Now, are we accepting that it's president Biden? I, I don't know. I'm confused by all that. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. Well, the electoral college, which we'll talk about here in a little bit has right. apparently decided. <laughs> okay. So, so, you know, if, if Biden decides to send in the tanks, then I guess that the tanks would probably settle the issue. But I think from a legal standpoint and from a philosophical standpoint, if you look at the declaration of independence, read the first lines of it, uh, you know, it talks about that that government is by the consent of the governed and that at any time the people have the right to alter or abolish their system of government and form a new one as it, as it suits them. So it's, it's kind of a, a natural right that's built into American political philosophy. So I think at this point, and it's interesting because, you know, I've been with the Tenth Amendment Center for uh, over a decade now. And, and when I first started 
we didn't talk about secession because it was just too, you, you're going to immediately get called a racist. And um, I think over the last four or five years, there's a lot more openness to the idea of political secession, both on the left and the right. I think, I think on both sides, some people are coming to see, you know what, maybe we do have too many differences. Maybe we would be better off to separate, go our separate ways and peacefully coexist. You know, and I think Brexit and, and some of the secession movements we've seen in Europe, I think those have kind of made people realize that, okay, secession doesn't necessarily have to be about slavery. So I think that's a – I think it should be on the table absolutely, quite honestly, because I think it is a peaceful way to separate, go our separate ways, and we can still coexist and we'll probably get along a whole lot better. Um, the question is – would the powers that be allow that to happen? And that, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know if Biden would send in the tanks. You know, uh, of course, now, you know, that that the, uh, the, the blues are in control of the national government is probably not going to be California wanting to leave. It's going to be a state like Texas. Um, and so the, that's the problem with the secession movement. It's just usually going to be the, the people that are out of power in D.C. that are going to have those inklings. And then that, you know, mm -hmm. that raises the question, will the powers that be in D.C. want to use violence to, to uh, hold the union together? I, I'm not of the opinion that the union is sacrosanct. I, you know, I, I can take it or leave it. I, <laughs> I, I actually think that's something the three of us agree on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that there isn't something, you know, sacrosanct about 50 – uh, individual states divided and, you know, lines drawn on the globe the way they are. Um, you know, if Pennsylvania and New York want to form a union and call themselves, you know, one state, then I suppose they should have the right to do that. And the the thing about, yeah, that's why I like this kind of conversation. It's like, there's a few things that like, you know, Mike, you and I could be having a conversation with someone who's kind of like, no, it has to be this way. <laughs> it has to be these 50 states because God ordained it or something like that. <laughs> Um, there are it, people not, that not think the way that. that is. Oh, I know. <laughs> I know. I I often tell people from my vantage point, I don't care whether or not we have a 50 state United States. What I care about is that people are free and flourishing. Yeah. And if that means that we have 38 states and 12 other states doing their own thing, maybe 12 separate nations or one nation together, however that is, if people are flourishing, then that's a positive movement in the history of, of humanity. One one thing that that I know is probably in the back of Colby's mind because it keeps coming up when he and I talk, and I'll ask you this, Mike, is there a way to make an argument for some of the things that we have today that you and I favor, like more states rather than like a single national government, without referring to the founding fathers? Because I don't think their sacred that you know their word isn't sacred either, um, and so I know that, and and I kind of I would say I agree with Colby in the sense that. Just like you said earlier, you know, we didn't sign the Constitution. There's a sort of a problem with that. We didn't sign it. You know, we weren't we weren't able to consent uh, to the law under which you know that was decided. You know, two and a half centuries ago. And so, what justification is there for things that are possibly frustrating to us today because they were, and, and maybe not necessarily you and me or or me, but um, frustrating to a lot of people today. Yeah, I, I guess I'll just leave the question there. Like, do you do you think that there are legit arguments based on the world we live in today rather than, oh, well, this is the explanation as to how it came about? Yeah, that's a, a good question. I mean, I have a political philosophy that is at great odds with constitutionalism. And, and you've already touched on one thing, just the whole issue of consent. Um, and, you know, it's interesting. Even Thomas Jefferson had questions about that whole idea. And there's a letter that he wrote. I can't remember who he wrote it to. Uh, but he actually discusses this and, and kind of floats the idea that a constitution should be redone about every every 30 years uh, with every new generation because one generation can't bind another. Um, so, you know, even at the time of the founding, some of the founding fathers were questioning yeah. this, this whole idea of, of legitimacy. But on the other hand, th there's the pragmatic mic that recognizes that we, we do live in a in, in a quote unquote real world that is dictated by the laws, you know, quote unquote laws of the land, the rule of law. And the Constitution is the foundation of that rule of law. So I really feel like any change that is going to happen 
is going to have to happen within that context because the vast majority of people aren't thinking about this as deeply as the three of us are. You know, they're, they, they've got their civics class maybe that they might or might not remember. And most of it is wrong anyway. Um, but so I feel like that, that the Constitution has to be the starting point of the change. But the fact of the matter is there is – there is that flexibility within that reality to create that change. We talked about secession. That's certainly one option to simply uh, have states or regions opt out of the current system. And once they do that, then they can create whatever form of government that suits their needs. You know, they would certainly have to, to reconstitute in some way. Within the system as it exists, I think there is some space that we could bring about changes through the amendment process. How effective that's going to be in the politically charged world that we live in, I, you know, I don't know. Well, if we're certainly run, if we're running an effectively nationalist mindset, then it's going to be very difficult. I mean, when was the last amendment? Sixties. Yeah, I mean, you still got that. The Equal Rights Amendment is still kind yep. of floating around out there in some way, and that's the kind of the but. It's interesting because somewhere along the line, and I don't, I can't really pinpoint when it was. Um, the I think in the mind of the founder, and there's a lot of things you can go back and look at the the political philosophy of the of the founding generation and, and look at it and go, you know, they got that wrong. I think one of the things that they got wrong is that they expected the amendment process to be used uh, a lot more robustly than than it has been. Um, but for some reason, somewhere along the line, we just decided that we're going to amend the Constitution with the Supreme Court, which I think is one of the dumbest systems you could ever possibly have in the world. I mean, you've got five politically connected lawyers, essentially, that that amend and, and alter the powers of government mm -hmm. and and. Like who likes lawyers to begin with, you know? And yet we put them in charge of of dictating things like marriage and, and equality and all of these things. Uh, and and on top of that, they form this like obscure black box that we basically put a law, a test law into, and hope it comes out the way that we want it to come out. Right, right. So I, you know that's this that's where it it gets really hard. You know, I'm I'm really good at if I can tell you how the Constitution is supposed to work. And I can even give you a strategy to quote unquote get back to the Constitution. But then that kind of begs the question do we want to get back to the Constitution or do we want to move forward to something that's better and, and more just and more fair? You know, I really feel like that at the core of any political change, there has to be a relatively widespread change of worldview. Uh, a change of mind. There's a, uh, oh, who, what band is it? It's not bad religion. It might be bad religion. Um, but we need, it's, it, the song is, we need a change of mind. And it's interesting because if you look at the evolution of political thought between the British system and the American system, there was a profound change in the way people viewed government and the role of government that made the American Revolution and the, the American political experiment possible. If, if you go back to the British system, basically the British system that exists in the colonial era was effectively what we have today. They had the quote-unquote living, breathing constitution. The constitution wasn't written down anywhere. Uh, the powers of government were basically defined by government. The parliament was sovereign. The parliament decided uh, that something was going to be, and that was the way it was, and there wasn't really anything to appeal to. And this is what rankled the colonists. You know, they felt like that the uh, British government was changing the rules in the middle of the game, taking away power from the uh, uh, the local governance, the local uh, legislatures. And they were like, hey, you can't do that. It violates the Constitution. And the British are like, I don't see that written anywhere. <laughs> we can do what we want to do. Uh, and, and so that's the system that we have today. But there was this shift in thought where – no, the government's not sovereign. The government doesn't get to make the rules. The people are sovereign. We get to make the rules. Government is a tool of the people. And therefore, we're going to write down this constitution because we want the powers of government to be specifically defined. We can point to it and say, uh, you know, this is, this is the way it is. That was kind of the shift in thinking that happened. You went from this idea that government, uh, I mean, you really went from an idea to, from the king being sovereign to 
um, the the legislative body, parliament being sovereign, to the kind of Lockean American uh, system where the people are sovereign and government has certain powers. I really think we need to have another shift in in thinking uh, where people recognize more the idea of self ownership and the idea of consent. And you know, in, in my ideal little world, we would have very, very small political system, very small political societies down to townships and neighborhoods where folks were uh, folks are agreeing together on on what the rules are going to be. But we're a long way from that because people think I'm nuts when I start talking about such things. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I am. Does, that, I, does that sound crazy to you, Colby? Or uh, I, I and I also want to hear kind of next to transition to conversation to some of the things that you find frustrating and inefficient. And this is where we can get a little more specific, more more so with things like the electoral college and representation. But anyway, does that does what is what Mike's saying sound that crazy or what, well, what do you think? Yeah, the the only I it doesn't sound like it would be a necessarily a bad system. Uh one of the things, Mike, that that I've kind of thrown out in this in this debate is, you know, the idea that, well, we could solve some of these problems if we just let the states retake the the sovereignty they're supposed to have and kind of work things out for each individual state sounds like a great idea. But I said to Doug, what do you do with the fact that like in this past week, I'll just use as an example, I, I bought more things from a company headquartered in Seattle, which you can probably figure out which one that was, than I bought from the store that was five minutes down the street from my house. And even if I were to go to the store that was five minutes, you know, from my house, most of the things that are in that store were made in other states or even in other countries practically. And, you know, my, my last two employers that I, uh, one, I worked for an organization from Florida and my current employer is headquartered in New Jersey. You know, my, I, we have two clients that I'm working with now in my one business. And the last one was from Nevada and this one's from Texas. So it's like, you know, this idea that states can kind of remain isolated, that local communities can remain isolated sounds nice, but I, I just kind of wonder how practical it really would be. Well, how practical is having countries? What do you mean by that? How practical is them functioning as individual countries? Right. I mean, we have we have a world that, you know, uh, Coca-Cola is operating out of Atlanta, Georgia, but it's selling Coca-Cola in Beijing. I mean, we managed to make that work. Yeah. I, I'm not convinced that that we have to have centralization in order to to make things operate and be more efficient. Now, I think in some cases it can, and, and really in any kind of any kind of political system, any kind of scenario like that, you kind of have to, to weigh the good and the bad. I think the bad of centralization outweighs the good. And, and if you look at it like any system, you know what makes a system robust or fragile. Well, one of the things that makes a system robust is redundancy. One of the things that makes a system robust is diversity. You can see that in biology. You know, we have two kidneys for a reason, not because we need two kidneys, but because if one fails, we got an extra. Diversity allows for experimentation. The problem with centralization is you end up with the situation where you have a very few people that are making decisions, and then they decide this is the best decision, and we get to impose that on this whole big thing you know, the United States. Well, that's all well and good if they make the right decision. But how often do politicians really make the right decision? So I would prefer a system where you've got 50 or 100 or however many decision makers. Let them have the free market of, of, uh, of, of government, so to speak, so that they can figure out which of these things work best. And then you know what will happen? People will copy the best things and they'll reject the worst. Um, like laboratory of democracy is, I think, the term that I've heard. Yeah, that's a, actually a Supreme Court justice. I think it was Brandeis who talked about the 50 laboratories of ideas. Well, in a centralized system, you have one uh, idea. And, and like I said, I, part, of the, my, part of my problem with centralized power is, is that I have a high level of disdain for politicians and people in government. So I honestly believe that a lot of them are sociopaths. So I don't trust them to come up with the with the best decisions. So I would rather have uh, a gridlock and a bunch of smaller governments checking each other as opposed to uh, mm-hmm. an, a system that's efficient. Efficiency is great as long as the efficiency is, uh, you know, being efficient at doing the right things. I mean, that was the whole joke with with Mussolini. You know, he made the, the trains run on time and, and Italy was a very efficient, country under fascism. 
I don't think we want to live under fascism though. So, mm-hmm. you know, I don't know. That, that's, I, I will always, that's, that's my bias. I will always favor decentralization over centralization. I'm, I'm, the same way with economics. And I think most people are. Yeah. You know, when you look at economics, if I suggested that, hey, we should have Walmart be the sole grocery provider in the United States because they'll be more efficient. And people wouldn't know that's a horrible idea because we're going to get <laughs> less products and we're going to get higher prices and we're going to get worse service and all of the things that come along with monopolies. Well, monopoly government's no more, no different really than, yeah. than a Walmart monopoly. And Yeah. The one thing that I had, that I add to that, Mike, is that, you know, you you have a, I even try to assume the best out of a politician trying to accomplish something at the same time. (laughs) Well, (laughs) I know, and I don't actually, but when I'm having these conversations, it's not really about, well, politicians are just all evil because, you know, you know, anybody who wants to pursue power over another person shouldn't be trusted with power over another person. I, 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 I get that, right? But even just assuming things like, well, let's just say that they have all the best intentions at heart and they're just trying to do their best job. That doesn't mean they have the knowledge to make good decisions for everybody. Like you could say, well, how often do they make good decisions? Well, well they, they do make good decisions for some specially favored people. Right. Right. And so the the conversation that Colby and I tend to lean toward is like this represent, or not say the lean toward, but like where the conversation keeps circling is around representation in, di- in in such disparate places, such as like Wyoming versus New York versus Pennsylvania, California, and so forth. And I know that Colby, Colby, and I'll let you speak for yourself here, but the idea that I keep saying is like, yeah, but Nancy Pelosi doesn't know what's best for the people of South Dakota, okay? Uh, Joe Biden doesn't know what's best for possibly the people in Delaware, but definitely not the people that live everywhere in the United States, right? And so they're just bound to not get it right. And so that's why concentrating power is not only inefficient, it's like, well, how, I mean, come on, even with the best people in government, like let's assume all the best people are in government, they still can't get it right because they don't have that information. They don't have the best information. And it's not in their interest to have that information. It's Hayek's knowledge problem. Yeah, on, on that level. Yeah, I think one of the other things that has been kind of driving this debate for us, probably for me, if if you're familiar with the uh, the the five moral foundations that they talk about, kind of underpinning a lot of people's, you know, that makes the difference between different people's political philosophy. Probably fairness is the one that is the strongest in my own moral framework, and so the one thing about our national federal system that I've had the hardest time accepting is the way that the the fact that each state gets equal representation in certain spheres creates such disproportional representation. Like I, I was talking with um, Doug earlier this week, and I was saying about how 25% of the U.S. population lives in 30 states. The 30 smallest states contain 25% of the U.S. population. Whereas the three largest states contain 25% of the U.S. population. And so that means if you're looking at the Senate, basically you have a 10 to 1 imbalance um, if if your goal was, you know, 100% equitable proportional representation. And, you know, so Doug and I have debated the uh, federal system has to account for states being considered entities rather than just individual persons as part of a collective population. So, of course, there's not going to be 100% perfect proportional representation. And, I, and I'm willing to accept that. But for me, a 10 to 1, something like a 10 to 1 imbalance is a pretty gross disproportion. And and so I guess our debate has been how much federalism, what are, what are the merits of federalism that would outweigh such a gross disproportion there? And this is the part of the conversation where I'm like, I wish Mike could answer that for me. Well, I mean, I, I don't really know how to answer the question because it's the you know, I mean, I guess it 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 depends on the system is what it is for a reason, and we can debate whether or not the reasons are valid or not. But I don't know how you change it without just saying, well, we're going to scrap the whole entire thing because it was intended. The Senate was created the way it was because the states were considered sovereign entities and therefore each state was supposed to have uh, equal representation. In fact, 
under the original system, and I think this was better, the uh, the, the people weren't even supposed to le- elect the senators. The uh, the state legislatures elected the senators, and the senators were literally the representatives of the states. And the House was the representative of the people, which which is is it similar in a way that like you know, the United States elects people to represent itself at the UN? Like we don't vote for who represents us in the UN, right? Right. I mean, yeah, I guess it's it's like it's, that I mean, in a sense. just using an a, 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 you know, an imperfect analogy. Right. You know, I mean, it's a, it's just a hard question. It's a hard question for me to even wrap my head around because I mean, we're talking about the system and it exists for this reason because we don't want California to be able to run roughshod over Wyoming. And and in effect it does in in the house. You know, Wyoming has what I don't know. I don't know about Wyoming. I can tell you, Kentucky one. has six. Kentucky has <laughs> one elector, uh, House representative. No, they have six. You meant Wyoming. Oh, Wyoming. Wyoming. I'm sorry. I was talking about Wyoming. Okay. So Kentucky has six and then, and then two senators. Um, so really in the big picture, I mean, you know, how many does California have? Like 556. <laughs> but you have the same problem in the states. I mean, you have a situation in California where effectively Los Angeles and San Francisco dominate the entire rest of the state. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's it's interesting if you and and this is you know I, I guess this gets down to really the the demographic split in the United States. The, it's not even really if you really look at it, the split in the United States is urban rule. Even in a in a quote unquote blue state like New York, if you actually look at at a county map, it's predominantly red. The only reason that it's blue is because New York City and uh, and Albany. And uh, maybe maybe the Buffalo area dominate the state politics there. So, you know, Florida is the same way. Florida is a red state, but it's it's basically 50 50 because you have so much population concentration in South Florida and in Tampa Bay area. Yeah. And then up in Jacksonville. So how you know, that's a That's something that's changed a lot since the founding, that the system isn't really set to deal with. The the system was kind of set to deal with the idea of the urbanized north versus the agricultural south. Now in every state we effectively have uh, you know the, these pockets of blue urban where the vast majority of population are, and then you have the rest of the country, and that's that's really where the political divide is. And um, ultimately, what you're going to end up with, and, and this has always been the case, is the is the urban ruling over the rule. And I don't know how you fix that, to be quite frank. Mm. Yeah, and Mike, I think you actually hit right on the head kind of the core of of what some of Doug and I have been debating, which is that, you know, the system when it was set up, the country was very different in in where people lived and where the population centers were and and as it's changed, uh, I guess that's been the question I keep asking is has the demographics of the country changed so significantly that the original system is really starting to become no longer workable that's i guess the question i'm asking when i'm talking right. about you know how can you justify these big these big inequities um yeah well, cuz i mean to, you have to look at it from the from the other point of view as well when you're talking about the inequity and the, the inequity works both ways because the the quote unquote progressive solution is something like a national vote i mean that's the that's the big thing with the president we'll get rid of the electoral college and we'll have a national vote how is it fair though that the urban population gets the lord over the rule the rural population and the rural population has absolutely no recourse in that system at all the 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 system as it exists actually gives a little bit of power to the more rural states. It's still, I think, drastically shifted towards towards the urban. So, you know, if you look at it just from from land mass, so I, I don't know how you know that's the problem with fairness. I mean, it's fairness is in the eye of the beholder. No, very true, and and honestly, I I've I th- that's what's led me to wonder whether a system where you know, rural, rural states, or really almost we should say rural areas. I think you had an excellent point when you said about New York. I was thinking about that myself just this morning, that that really Western New York State probably has more in common with the very rural portions of Northern Pennsylvania right. um, than, 
either of them have in common with Philadelphia or New York City. Right. You know, so if you really wanted to make states where people could kind of des- decide collectively based on a commonality, you know, you'd make northern Pennsylvania and western New York into one state and you'd make Philadelphia, New Jersey and New York City into another state, you right. know, something like that. You look at look at a place like Kentucky and that's, you know, I'm from Kentucky originally, so that's I I know the political dynamics there where it's I don't know that there's a redder state than Kentucky, maybe West Virginia. Um Maybe Wyoming, but Fayette County, which is where Lexington is, and Jefferson County, which is where Louisville is, is as blue as you can get. Both both of those counties went overwhelmingly to Biden. Every place in this state was overwhelmingly Trump. So you know, even even within that state, now the balance of population is such that Louisville and Lexington can't really dominate politics in Kentucky because there is enough rural population, like the whole rest of the state, that that kind of makes it. Uh, balance out a little bit. But, you know, and I'll throw this out there, and and I can't really speak in a real educated way about this, but I have read uh, some political philosophers, some political thinkers who will argue that maybe it's time to stop thinking politically in terms of geography and and start thinking in terms of of different, different ways to organize, and that that may be possible with the advent of technology, where you have, where you could actually have uh, you know, people that are in, you know, you, you take Lexington and Louisville and, and let them be their own thing together. And then the rest of the Kentucky could be its own thing together. And you could actually do that, even though uh, they're they're separated. Um, and again, I'm not, you know, I'm not well read enough into that to, to say, oh, that's a great idea. It would work. But <laughs> there are people that are thinking in those terms that seem to think that that's a possibility. And maybe we do need to, yeah. I mean, maybe it's time we really rethink the entire political uh, political system. And, and I was kind of hinting at that before when I talked about a change in mindset. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting because when I talk about the, you know, I talk about the idea of voluntarism, which I think is, is ethically the, the only legitimate system of quote unquote government where everything is consensual. And, you know, we agree to, we agree to interact or we agree not to interact, uh, there's no coercion, there's no force. And people say, well, that can't work. Well, no, it can't work because nobody believes that it can work. Nobody accepts that that framework. Um, but if you go back to, you know, 1600 and you suggested that, you know, maybe we should have a system where the people are sovereign and not the king. Well, everybody be like, you can't do that, you know? So I don't know. We need some. We need some good thinking because I, I think I think we all agree. I think this is where we can really where we can really come around a, a, mm. a bit of agreement that what we have really doesn't work. Um, and and even somebody who might say, and and you know I'm I'm probably more pro constitution than either one of you. I, I see its merits. Maybe I'm biased because I've spent way too much time reading founding fathers stuff. But you've been um, corrupted. Yes, I, I'm. I'm a flaming statist, but uh, you know, <laughs> I, I think we can all. I, I think I will accept the notion that you know the the world has changed vastly since then, and and maybe that you know that's not the way to go either. And um, you know, I think that's the real positive of a conversation like this is that that we can kind of look at it objectively and not yell at each other and and. You hate Trump, so I hate you. <laughs> because that seems to be what politics has devolved into in, in the United States. And yeah. we, we've all coalesced around our personalities and mm. instead of really trying to think, okay, how can we, as I think uh, Doug put it beautifully, how can we live prosperous lives? Because that's really what we all want, right? We want to raise our kids. We want to have good lives and, and you know, find quote-unquote happiness in, in the uh, – in the big picture sense, nobody really wants to do politics except for politicians. Um, so, except yeah. those who profit off doing politics. Uh oh, <laughs> Mike. One <laughs> of the things I'll uh, I'll throw out here, and and um, kind of following on where you were saying about maybe you know we would could think about some different way of of electing representatives that that wasn't so tied to geography. This is one of the things that um, I saw firsthand during my time in Japan and really loved and thought made a super amount of sense is that um, their House of Representatives actually has a, a, a sizable portion of it. I think it's like one third or something of that of the representatives are are elected by proportional representation according to political party. So basically, um, 
people in, I think they do it by regions. I don't think they do it by the whole country, but basically um, in a given region, people cast their vote um, in addition to their local representative for a political party. And then at the end, all of those votes are tallied up and you know, each party gets a certain number of representatives allotted to it based on how many people in that region voted for that party. Hmm. And it, it, to me, it just seemed like a really great way of allowing, for example, you know, if all of the libertarians across the Northeast, for example, could all vote for libertarian candidates, well, they're never going to elect a, a representative in a in a single seat constituency, you know, because there's just not enough right. of them. But if there's 5% of them, and so out of 100 representatives, they get one, at least they have some sort of representation now. Mm. Um, so to me, that that would actually be a, a um, realistic system, a system that's already in use in certain places for maybe doing something toward what you were referring to. That's interesting. I've, I've always been intrigued that I've not studied it enough to really, to even be able to flesh out the pros and cons. But if you look at some of the uh, the European governments where you have, you know, multiple parties and, and parties have to kind of, I know Germany is like this, you know, you have all that, you have three or four or five or, you know, this whole bunch of parties and uh, you have to, they have to kind of coalesce in order to create a governing majority in the parliament. And, you know, sometimes I think that that might be healthier than than the two party system that we've evolved into in the United States, where, you know, at least in in that situation, you've got some people with some divergent views that have to think, okay, we can come together and agree on these things and, and create a, a governing coalition, so to speak. You know, and maybe maybe something like that would be healthier. The the two party system's a wreck. Yeah, I would I would say that if if any uh, of of the listeners are not familiar with multi party and and like parliamentary systems, you know, really take a good look at it because I I the more I learned about the system that was in Japan, and I think other parliamentary systems are similar. The more a lot of those things really made sense to me. Yeah, I think if we could get rid of the two party system and, and have more parties, not only would you have more engagement of people in politics because they feel like they could have parties that represented them, but but we could find more of that middle ground. Then there wouldn't be such. Uh, the tribalism I don't think would be so strong if it wasn't just a, a, a dualism. Hmm. Well, I, I I think that comment, Colby, is probably a really uh, good way to segue out of this conversation. I feel like if we ever did a part two, it, uh, this would this would get even better because this conversation is just kind of getting generated here and getting a good flow. But we we are out of time, <laughs> and, and much to my dismay, because I'm enjoying this, especially some of the back and forth that I'm hearing here. But your comment about being open to reading and seeing how other governments do things is something that the American people are typically not too willing to do, partly because it's probably like, oh, well, it's a long shot. What on earth am I doing trying to learn something new? It's not like it's going to happen. So, you know, there's, there's low interest on that hand, on the one hand. But on the other, in terms of educating ourselves and being willing to see how other things operate and sort of expand our way of thinking – it's always a good way to, always a good practice. And I, whether whether we agree on practical politics or not, Colby, I know that I do envy your time in another country for such a long period of time because you were actually able to sort of you know, imbibe what the, the way in which it worked. It wasn't just you studying it on the side. I don't know how much you were even able to participate as a foreigner, but um, you were able to see it working over, you know, more than just, you know, one election cycle or whatever it might be. So I want to thank both of you for contributing to my education and learning how to, one, have good conversations, second, how to understand, you know, the way in which we can think about how we do life together and uh, for joining me for that. My pleasure. That was fun. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Libertarian Christian Podcast. If you liked today's episode, we encourage you to rate us on Apple Podcasts to help expand our audience. If you want to reach out to us, email us at podcast at libertarianchristians.com. You can also reach us at LCI Official on Twitter. And of course, we are on Facebook and have an active group you are welcome to join. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Libertarian Christian Podcast is a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute, a registered 501c3 nonprofit. If you'd like to find out more about LCI, visit us on the web at libertarianchristians.com. 
The voiceovers are by Matt Bellis and Catherine Williams. As of episode 115, our audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com. 